I'm going to talk about is so Larry's going to talk about his journey into astrophotography, uh, starting with DSLR and and you know he's a tremendous resource for all of us, a uh, great wealth of knowledge. And he's going to share us uh, uh, his experience with cameras, mostly the cameras and, and uh, filters, but maybe much more. Uh, so Larry, I'll give you the floor and, and take it away. And we'll take, uh, do you want us to take questions? Do you want to take questions as we go along or later on at the end? As you go along would be best. That way we can address them. So you okay. need to share screen or? Uh, yeah, Bob, uh, uh, Bob, uh, Colbert needs, Colbert needs to give you uh, the ability to uh, share a screen by making you a host. Bob, are you there? I think you should be able to do it now. Uh, it's, yes. it's set to be one participant can share at a time. So well, I'll say multiple ones and see uh, if that helps. See if you can share. OK. Just a second here. Um, it's coming up. I, I just need to. Uh, start way through. I'm going to have to change things a little bit. Okay, we got I, it, uh, uh, Larry. Okay, Larry. good. Um, I've got a couple of um, uh, things I want to bring up on a web browser. And so partway through, I'll have to juggle things. We'll see how easy that goes. Um, so go ahead and get started then. The, um, one of the things I wanted to, to pretty much focus on tonight wasn't pictures, but to talk about cameras. And there's um, a guy by the name of Chase Jarvis that been around for quite some time. And he's got a saying that you'll run across most likely if you've been into any type of um, earth type photography, the normal stuff that you would do here, not the astro. And his argument has been for some time that the best camera you've got is the one that you have with you. And so <laughs> one of the things I'm not trying to do is convince people to upgrade. I'm not trying to convince them that they should have an astro camera or whatever. Just learn about the cameras and learn that they're a tool. And when you find that out and start thinking of them like that, um, you can do a lot with the tools you have. And the more you learn about the camera, the better you're gonna be able to use it and the more you can do with it. And you may find that it's um, at some point you'll wanna upgrade and if you do, then that should work, work well for you because you'll upgrade to something that'll work well for the kind of stuff that you like to do. So um, ask questions, please, as they come up. And um, I am fairly new to astrophotography. And so if you've got a different point of view than me, bring it up. I'm more than happy to, to, to listen to different views and talk about it. Uh, one of the things I've learned is that a lot of folks have got different approaches to astrophotography, and um, they are all the same, and that uh, people have different ways of approaching the problem. And uh, what works for me may not work for you or vice versa. So I started out with a DSLR, and uh, I picked up uh, just uh, two or three months back uh, a ZWO ASI 2600 monochrome camera. And uh, I still use both of the cameras. I see a need for it and the advantage of having both. And um, unfortunately, most of my camera examples in this presentation are for the, uh, the ZWO camera that I have. And the reason is because that's what I'm familiar with. I already had the, uh, the manual and the, the documentation about the sensor and stuff. And same kind of thing for Vader uh, filter examples. Um, when I got my first telescope a few years back, the shop I got it from, it was a used scope. And I wanted to use it for astrophotography, but also through eyepieces. And I, I picked up a couple of Vader filters because the proprietor at the shop liked Vader a lot. And, um, convinced me that they were good. And when I searched into it, they were 
good filters. Not the most expensive, not the less expensive, kind of a middle of the road in some ways. Um, but I've been happy with them, so I've stayed with that with my monochrome camera. And I'm not going to try to compare cameras. I'm not going to get into um, the different types of, of sensors per se, but just want you to understand what's out there on cameras so that you can make the decision on what, what makes sense for the way you do things. And one of the ways that I kind of looked at this after I got the presentation together is this doesn't flow as much as this a bunch of nuggets that I picked up as I got into astrophotography. And I don't think I'm done with that. I think there's a lot more of them that are coming down the road. So I wanna talk about three different types of cameras. Um, the first one is cell phones. Um, then DSLR and mirrorless. And I'm combining those two together because they're, they're very similar, but at the same time, there are some differences in the way they work because with the DSLR, you uh, are looking through the lens or the telescope, where with the mirrorless, you're actually looking at a, an image that's created, projected onto a, a little small screen through the eyepiece. And then a little bit about dedicated astro cameras. And I'm not gonna get into much with the guide cameras and stuff. Um, it's gonna be more of a DSO, deep sky object type stuff, but uh, we'll see where we go with that. So the reason I wanted to start out with cell phones is um, that the current crop of cell phones actually have got a lot of capability that you can unlock if you get a manual app for a camera. And uh, the machine itself, the, the phone, um, has a lot of functionality that the standard uh, cameras may or may not take advantage of. But you can find different camera apps that you can install that will give you manual focus. And some of them will even stack raw frames and create raw, raw frames. So it's really closer in some ways to a uh, uh, mirrorless or a DSLR. Uh, you are going to have to connect to the telescope via a digiscope method. And we'll talk a little bit about what that really means in a few minutes. Uh, but expect these cell phone cameras to continue to improve. Um, there's some telescope systems that are coming out now where they'd actually use a tablet or a cell phone as the display device, but there's a sensor that's built into the, uh, the telescope system. And th there's some interesting promise with those because what they're doing is linking some of these systems together so that you don't have to take all the images yourself. You can actually share those with other people. But since this is on cameras, I don't really want to get into that. I just expect things to continue to improve for the cell phones. And um, so I'm not going to talk any more about these, but just keep your eye on them. Look at what they're doing as new systems come out. Uh, would, this, would this be more for uh, uh, EAA type of applications uh, mostly? It, it's the ones I've seen, I mean, they, that's what it looks like they're for because you're able to quickly bring up an image. And um, it, it, there's a lot of capability there. I've, I've looked at some of the stuff that, uh, that Bob and, and Dave Elder have done, and there's some amazing things you can do with just real short exposures with the current cameras and the, the scopes that these guys are using. But uh, I, I think that's where cell phones are probably going to hit the sweet spot because most of the folks that are going to want that kind of camera are probably not going to want to spend the time that we do with the astro cameras where we're taking an hour or several hours worth of images and then processing it into a final one. Any other questions? OK. Um, the next type is um, the digital single lens reflex or the mirrorless cameras and talking about advantages and disadvantages on them. Um, one of the big things is you probably already have one of these cameras because if you've done any photography, 
with family, friends, landscape, staffs, you probably have one. And it's probably going to be uh, uh, very useful for astrophotography if you want to try it. Uh, the cost of these cameras can be fairly low. Um, they can get pretty expensive if you want to get a high-end camera, but it doesn't have to be. They, they connect via a T-ring, which is a very um, uh, flexible adapting connection to a telescope. And um, many years ago, I don't think I've seen any camera lenses that have come out with uh, T-ring screwing connectors recently for a number of years. But it used to be that that was a common way to buy uh, a long telephoto lens, that you would buy one that had a, a screw-in connector, you would attach a T-ring based on your camera body, and off you were going. But that same mechanism works telescopes, and it works very well. Um, a lot of these cameras support video, and some of them actually have got the ability to um, crop the, the sensor down. Like I've got some, a couple of Nikons that are full frame and they'll crop down to an APS-C, uh, a four by five ratio format that's even smaller. And, and I think there's even a smaller ratio that it can go to. The results from these can be very, very good, even excellent. Um, and Canon and Nikon have made DSLRs that were specifically for astrophotography, they used a different filter over the sensor so that the, um, the um, hydrogen alpha and some of the deep reds will come through that are normally blocked for the light that we see on the Earth. You do have several options for modifying the cameras. This would be the filter, but also you can um, come through and do some things that will reduce the heat buildup, which is one of the disadvantages of this camera. Um, so while we're on the disadvantage corner, the IR filter limits the visibility in the hydrogen alpha and deep orange, red orange range. Um, so you, normally you don't have any cooling, so you get a lot more noise and these show up as hot pixels. Um, there is a way to block those out in the normal long exposure, and I'll talk about those near the end of the presentation. Um, but it doesn't really work for astrophotography, and I'll talk about that more later. So um, these cameras aren't really made for really long exposures because the sensor heats up a lot when you get into 30 seconds, a minute, and more. You can modify the cameras, like I said earlier, but it's going to cost extra. If it's under warranty, it's no longer under warranty if you make these changes. Um, there is a possible change in the focus point when you start mucking around, changing the filters around. And um, if you try to add cooling to these cameras, the schemes I've seen make the camera kind of awkward to use and to hold, and it may actually disable some of the functionality of the camera. And a lot of these um, types of cameras also have an anti-aliasing filter for Marais. And uh, if you get into changing the, uh, the, the filter that handles infrared, you're also going to have to do something with that filter. And that may create more issues for you than you really want to get into. The uh, dedicated astro cameras, um, they're designed specifically for astrophotography. So they really work well when you hook them up to a telescope. Um, you do have different models that are out there that work well with imaging and for guiding. And many of the models, um, you can get them in an uncooled version or a cooled version, or you can kind of split the cameras that come from the different manufacturers into uncooled and cooled. If you get a cooled camera, you're going to have a lot less noise. And we'll talk about that later on in the graph that'll show you what, what the advantages are. It's a lot easier if you do have a cooled camera to create your calibration frames because you can cool the temperature down to whatever you want to use outside. During the summer, I'm finding that's problematic here. Um, 
because I can drop down about 30, 35 degrees below the ambient temperature. But when it's over 100 degrees, that still isn't all that cool. But um, if I start out with um, about 60, 70 degrees, I can easily get down below, um, below freezing. And so it's, it's amazing what these cold cameras can actually do. Noise levels can be extremely low with these cameras, um, not only because of the cooling, but also because of the design. Um, they support long exposures very well. And um, most of them support different frame sizes. And this for different frame sizes are nice because if you're trying to do something with uh, very small objects, you really don't need the full size of the frame. And it means that you're creating smaller files and the files are gonna be transferred off the camera into a storage device or computer of some sort quicker and easier. And so there's some advantages of having different frame sizes. Uh, most of them also support video, and for certain types of astrophotography, video is the preferred way to do it. You can also mount um, normal camera lenses via um, a special adapter that um, you can get for most of these that connect the, um, the Astro camera into whatever Nikon or Canon and whatever other brands they support that go into their standard lens. And I think there's some, there's some interest there. I haven't played with it much, but um, if the lens has got a foot, it's pretty easy to mount it. Um, and um, that word ring should be ring. Um, there's a special ring mount that you can get for some of the cold cameras because they don't have a tripod thread. And what this ring mount does is it uh, allows you to attach that to a mount and then have the, um, especially the wide angle lenses that don't have a foot or even the, the standard shorter lenses and use those with the cold cameras. So some of the disadvantages are that they're dedicated for astrophotography. You wouldn't be able to realistically use these things for any other type of photography where you're carrying it around. Because you need some sort of a computer type device, even though it may be uh, an ASI Air or something that was small that would drive it, but you still need something to control that. And um, they don't have any buttons on the outside like the normal cameras do with the DSLRs and mirrorless. And so those physical controls are one of the things that set the DSLRs and mirrorless apart. When you get into the higher end versions of those cameras, a lot of the controls are pushed to the outside because they're much easier for professional photographers to use than trying to dip into a menu, make a change, and then get back out and find what you're trying to photograph. And uh, some of the astro cameras are very expensive and, and um, that you, you get what you're paying for, I think on these, but some of them are very expensive. But then kind of a flip side of that is it's amazing the capability that you can get from the current crop of, of astro cameras. Uh, the, the, the resolution, the detail, the sensitivity that you get out of these are just amazing. So, First thing I wanted to do was talk about ways to connect a camera to a, a telescope. And uh, there's, there's five ways. These came off a, a Teleview rep website and um, it shows their, um, their view on it. And um, it also talks though about some of their products. Um, so excuse me for that, but uh, like this Paracor, but um, the main thing is to look at the diagram on the left and then just use the words on the right as a way of filling in the, what the information is. So the, the way most folks are doing things is they're using a, a prime focus with their telescope. And in this example, they're just using a, a simple lens for the telescope and it could be a lot more complex. Than this. It could be a refractor, it could be a reflector or whatever. 
but the idea is, is that you have your camera um, and hit mouse where the, the telescope is focusing. And there's a way to focus this. And um, so it's pretty simple, um, nothing too critical as far as where you place the camera, as long as you can get enough distance between the center of the lens, the nodal point there, and where that lens focuses so that you can get it focused on the, the, the sensor and you're good to go. The second way of doing it is um, one that a lot of us are actually have migrated to. And what's happened is um, we, um, I'll talk a little bit more about this later, but a lot of folks may find that their telescope is kind of long for what you want to photograph because a lot of these sky objects, um, they cover the range from very small to very, very large. And so there's a way of putting a reducer at the end of the telescope. And what that does is two things. One is it changes the effective focal length so like in their example, they've got a 0.8 times reducer. If you had a thousand millimeter telescope, it drops down to an 800 millimeter. And so you can actually see more of the night sky. The other advantage is that it actually makes the, the telescope effectively faster. So if it was, if say it was um, an F10, which is probably too, too slow, but it suddenly drops by 0.2, um, so it's down to a 0.8 point, or I'm sorry, an F8 telescope. And so you can find other reducers that will take you down even farther. And there's uh, another game that some of the folks do with um, some of the reflector SCPs, where they put a hyperstar in that kind of follows this idea, but it actually just takes another element out of the telescope. Our telescope and gives you a very fast, very short telescope that's wonderful for making quick images. The next scheme is where you actually want something that's longer, and that's where you add a Barlow. And the term power native, if you've not run across it, it's a type of Barlow that Teleview makes in market, and it's not really a Barlow. Uh, it behaves differently in the lenses, and I couldn't really tell you the details on it. Um, but a lot of folks that are into astrophotography through a, a Barlow um, seem to prefer a power mate because it's better corrected than a, a, a Barlow, but you do spend more for them than you do a straight Barlow. And so what this would do is you can either get like a two times or two and a half or four or even more. And so if you're familiar with um, normal DSLR and, and mirrorless cameras, it's like putting a, a teleconverter into the, uh, behind the lens uh, before the camera. So if you put it two times there, whatever the effective focal length is, you just doubled it. And it slows the lens down. So um, you're, you would have two stops if you did it two times, then you're gonna have two stops lower. So if the thing was an F8, then it's gonna be an F16. Uh, first stop to F11, and then the second one to F16. And so it's gonna become much slower, but you get a, a magnified image out of it. Then uh, the next one is eyepiece projection. This is one I kind of looked at when I first got into it. Um, my telescope, I'm just thinking about connecting my DSLR to it. Um, what's happening here is that second lens is actually your eyepiece. And what you do is you take the lens off the camera and then you mount it through a special adapter that fits over the, the end of the eyepiece. And effectively, what you're doing is projecting through the eyepiece onto the, the sensor point. And from what I found, this can work well, but it's kind of a little bit finicky. And um, 
but it's a great way if you need a lot of magnification and you don't want to get into the Barlow's, um, this allows you to do it, but you may end up having light fall off around the edges because of it. And then the last option is digiscoping, which I mentioned with the, um, the cell phones. And on this one, the camera lens stays on. You've got the eyepiece. And what you're doing here is you're using the, the camera with the lens to capture the light that's coming through the eyepiece and project it on the, the, the sensor plane. Um, if you ever try to hold a uh, cell phone up against an eyepiece and get a picture through it, it's possible, but it's dang hard. And uh, I know there's adapters out there that allow you to be more repeatable as far as moving and alignment. Um, it's something that uh, I found too finicky. And so I stayed with one of the first three options, mostly the, um, the prime focus and the one with the, um, the reducer. So any questions on connecting? Does someone have a question? Not that I heard. Okay, sounds good. So next I wanted to talk a little bit about different types of um, astrophotography subjects. Um, so nightscapes, um, moon photography, lunar, uh, planetary, deep sky objects, and then other things like comets, asteroids, satellites, and then scientific images. And um, these last two, I'm really not going to talk more about. Um, just recognize that folks deal in these areas. And I don't really have much experience. I've tried to photograph a couple of comets and uh, mixed results. And satellites are just too fast. The only ones I've caught of those that you could tell were when I was shooting deep sky objects and I see this streak comes through. And all it does is mess up the image for that, that particular shot. In asteroids, I don't have a setup that comes anywhere close to that. So um, nightscapes, uh, this is very similar to landscape photography, but you may be using a tracker or a mount for longer exposures. And think of this as more of, a, you're gonna have some, most likely you're gonna have some mountain range, some plants, some structures um, in the lower part of the image. Some of it may even go fairly high into the image. And then you may pick up some of the night sky in it, um, especially if, if we've got the Milky Way out and the Milky Way is rising above it. It can be quite lovely. And for these kind of images, I think the DSLR or the mirrorless cameras are the best options just because they, they tend to work well. You put them on a tripod. There are trackers that they work pretty well with. If you try to use an astro camera, um, you're gonna have to probably connect a, a camera lens that may be on the normal or wide side for a DSLR or mirrorless um, because a telescope is probably gonna be zoomed in way too much for what you're wanting to do. Um, so normally you're going to use wide angle lenses, but there's a, um, a rule and, and there's very variants of this. Um, the one that I normally use is called the 400 rule. And um, so if you take the, uh, the 400, you divide it by the lens focal length and the focal length needs to be what the, uh, the camera sees the uh, focal length as of the lens. So think of it as, um, I'm familiar with Nikon cameras. So a full frame Nikon camera and then their crop sensor, the APS-C is 50% crop. So if I have a, um, a 24 millimeter um, lens on a crop sensor, then it's gonna be the equivalent of a 36 millimeter lens uh, on full frame. And so you'd have to use 36 for the, um, this rule. And what that gives you is the number of seconds roughly before the stars start showing trailing. 
And by trailing, what I mean is the, the stars are no longer round. They actually have got movement in them that you can see in the direction from the Earth's rotation. And if you don't want to be um, um, test critical, you can do a 300. Um, and then there's also a 500. Um, and you'll come across all of these flavors. And um, there's some arguments out there depending on your sensor resolution on which one you should use. But just treat it as a rough rule of thumb on how many seconds. And the way around it is if you want to go longer than that for the exposure, um, then you're probably going to need to use a tracker. Just recognize that the landscape is going to start getting blurry because tracker is going to cause the, the sky um, to look the same for the stars if you're in sync with them on the rotation. But it's going to end up rotating the Earth relative to the camera. So you're going to end up with a slightly blurred um, mountain or plant or whatever it is you're shooting to show the foreground. And that may not be a problem because often they're just in silhouette anyway. Questions? Okay, um, lunar photography or the moon. Uh, pretty much any camera, uh, you're probably going to want to use a long lens or a telescope. Um, I actually like to use my telescope with um, a DSLR I've got. And uh, it works quite well for the moon. It fills up the frame pretty well. Uh, the longest lens I've got for my, um, my camera is a 400 millimeter, but I can go out to uh, two times on teleconverters. And so I can get up to 800 millimeters for the telescope is 1200. So it's zoomed in a little bit more and fits better for what the moon does. And um, I've run across that you can even use a mono camera with the filter wheel if you've got a really bright moon because um, the images are going to be short in duration. Um, you're not going to have the moon moving um, um, much during the time. And if you're tracking the moon through a mount, then you're probably OK with it anyway. But the usual way of taking the pictures of the moon that's recommended is to do a video and then you use software to extract only the best frames. And this is called lucky imaging. Uh, the faster the video rate you can do, the better it is. And um, that doesn't quite work though for a lunar eclipse. When you start um, imaging the, 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 the moon, you can get away with a video, but when the moon starts getting really dim, if it's a, if it's a full lunar eclipse, you're probably going to be, depending on your ISO settings and or gain settings, you may be into a couple, three seconds and um, for exposure. And that doesn't really work with the, the video. And so in those cases, probably a single exposure is going to be the best. And if you're doing a lunar eclipse, I'm not sure that a mono camera with the color wheel would work for those cases. Okay, uh, planetary, um, similar to lunar imaging, but the planets are much smaller and you don't have to worry about the eclipses like we do with the, the, the moon for those. So probably the longer the telescope, the smaller the camera sensor is gonna work better. And even then you may still need to put a Barlow or two on there and, and get some additional length. And this is something I haven't really played much with as far as um, as far as uh, shooting with my astro camera or even with the DSLRs. So cool the astro camera, the biggest advantage you're gonna have with it is oops. Yeah, that was it. That so talking about the cooled astro camera, whoops, hit the wrong button. Uh, the biggest advantage you're going to have with it is that for cold cameras, the noise level is going to be much, much lower. Um, for the ZWO cameras, the current crop of cold ones, it looks like you can drop down to about 35 degrees Celsius below whatever the ambient temperature is. And I suspect that the other brands are very similar to this. 
um, it does require a fair amount more battery capacity when you're trying to pump all the way down 35 below and um, it's warm outside or even hot. And uh, so the, one of the big advantages you get from this besides the noise is that the calibration files are much easier to take and they're more accurate to use. And um, like I said earlier, you can pull DSLRs or mirrorless cameras, but your results are gonna vary depending on how you approach it. I've even seen one guy that made a, um, basically a styrofoam box that set around his DSLR. And uh, he basically cooled the inside of the box that cooled the whole camera. And I'm not quite sure how well that worked, but it was kind of a novel approach where you didn't have to modify the camera itself. So when you look at the cooled cameras, this is the temperature curve for the, um, the ZWO ASI 2600MM, the monochrome sensor. <coughs> and sorry about the temperature steam in Celsius here, but I'll give you an idea of what's going on. So th this graph is plotting dark current on the left side versus temperature in the sensor. And when you're dealing with, um, with the dark current, the best way to think of it, if you've done any astrophotography, you probably have created what are called darks. And uh, that's what this is, is showing effectively here is the noise that those dark frames uh, show and allow you to edit out of the, uh, the processed image. And so if you're, say, at about 25 degrees um, um, Celsius, and if you can drop that down to minus 10 degrees, because you can drop down um, minus 35 degrees, your noise level is coming down extremely low. So you're coming from 0.06 down to 0.6. Oh, zero, maybe 0. 0.0006. And so you're not going to have nearly as much. Um, they, they show up as hot pixels, and they may be, um, if you're dealing with the mono camera, they'll, they'll show up as a uh, just a hot pixel. If you're dealing with a, uh, a DSLR or a one shot color ca astro camera, they're gonna show up as kind of a little bloom because um, you may get color out of these depending on how strong and how bright that dark current was. But this amount of noise that you're getting out of this camera when you cool it or this sensor really um, is amazing. It's enough where I hear some people talk that you don't really need to take darks anymore because the amount of noise that you're trying to process out is so little that it is negligible and it may very well get processed out something else you're doing with um, the flats and the dark flat. Question? Okay. So if you look at how efficient the cameras are too, um, your group, this is the same sensor again for the that ZWO camera. And you're probably someplace in this range is where you're gonna be from 400 up to around 700, maybe a bit over. That's gonna be the normal range where you're taking the, the, the images. And so the quantum efficiency of this particular sensor, it takes out just over 90%. A lot of the cameras out there are gonna be much lower, maybe even half as high. And what this is telling you is that for every proton that comes in that hits one of the photocytes on the sensor, um, this is most likely going to result, uh, depending on the wavelength that's coming in, most likely result in the capture of that proton. If you're down about 50%, and only half of them, if you're down below that, even less than half of them will result in a proton that gets converted into an electron and would show up as light in the final image when you look at the print. 
So the, the current crop of cameras are just amazing. The sensors that are in them are well worth looking at if you're considering looking at a, a new camera. So looking more at sensor properties, and these are curves that you should be able to find for your current um, astro camera. I don't know that it'd be easy to find these for um, DSLR or mirrorless. I've not run across them, but they may be out there. Um, I've also seen something that if you've got the, uh, the paid version of uh, SharpCap, I believe it's got some capability to create these curves with uh, a camera that you feed uh, frames into it. And so I haven't played with that though, so I'm not really sure what's going on. I just ran across a couple of references. So this first um, full diagram, oh, um, so there's four diagrams here and the, um, the x-axis at the bottom is gain in units um, of 0.1 uh, decibels. And these may look like Greek to you at first, but when you're looking at a camera, there's a wealth of information of, that can be found in these. And um, I found out some things about the, the camera I thought that I didn't realize when I was preparing this and looking at these curves closer. Um, so the first one is the full well depth. This is how many electrons each um, photo side or pixel on your sensor can hold. And notice that as you increase the gain on the camera, the, the depth or how many electrons you can put in that photo site is getting smaller and smaller. It doesn't really mean that the photo site is getting, getting smaller in capacity. What it means is, is that you're adding gain. And as you add gain to the number of electrons that are in that photo site, um, and you start processing it, what you're liable to do when you're above this amount, say this 100 point here, when you're above this amount, um, if you get above that, what's going to happen is you apply the gain and you're going to end up flooding into adjacent sensors. Some cameras have got the ability to control that flooding that goes across. But if you've taken any astrophot photographs and you look at a bright star and it looks like it's kind of bloomed out and gotten bigger, um, and there's no real detail there, chances are good that that's what was going on. You filled up that the photo site and the because a star should be a point, and you filled up that photo site and the electrons have overflowed into the adjacent um, pixel. And um, there are some sensors, and I don't know which ones do this, I suspect they're the higher end ones, that do have an ability to drain off those extra electrons so that you don't have that, that blooming effect that comes from it. So any question on well depth? Okay. The next one, this is a curve that I really didn't appreciate or understand well before I started this. Um, this presentation. Notice that this curve starts out at uh, 0.8 and then just drops down and it becomes almost asymptotic to the x-axis. And what this is, is really, it's the count of the electrons per the ADU, the analog digital unit that um, the camera um, supports. And I'm gonna jump ahead one slide here. So think of, look at, remember this curve and this next slide is gonna show it for a different ZWO camera. And it looks more like you would normally expect from a sensor. So this is a, um, a ZWO ASI 1600. And notice that the D e, e minus slash um, ADU or the gain um, starts out to about five and then drops down. One of the things that you normally get from this graph for your sensor is where it reaches one is what's called unity gain. And what that 
that often means is that often a recommendation on what gain value you should use when you're using the camera. But when you looked at the, the previous slide, um, it never did get up to one even. And it's just a characteristic of that particular sensor and the 16-bit ADU that, that that camera brings into play with the sensor. And so what it means is it's got plenty of, of, of ADU capacity to handle the electrons that um, the sensor is going to collect. And so you really don't have a unity game that you can identify off this graph um, for the uh, 2600 um, sensor. So let me go back one again. So, so, so uh, Larry, what does the gain on the y-axis mean again? Um, that for this graph, what that is, is it takes the, the electrons. If you take 50,000, this point, um, can you see my, my yes, mouse? Yes, I can see it. Okay, if you take 50,000, and that point that's down here is just under... Um, so 0.75. 0 0.7, yeah, 0 0.76. Um, if you take 50,000 and divide that... Get my head on straight here. Yeah, divide that by... Two to the sixteenth, you end up with 0.76. If you take this level that the camera can capture in electrons, divide it by two to the sixteenth, you get this. And so this is what this graph actually is. It took me a while to figure out and, and find a definition that really told me what was going on. So it's another representation of the depth flow, basically, because... Uh, um, representation of what, I mean? Of uh, full well depth? Um, kind of. Um, well, it doesn't see, matter. Maybe you're getting... It, the depth. best way to think of it is if your camera has this, um, it, it's going to have a, a graph like this. Yeah. And most of the time, it's going to look like this, where it starts above one, and someplace down here, it's going to get to the one point. Mm -hmm. And wherever that one point is for that camera, that's probably your best game setting to start with with that camera. Doesn't mean you can't go higher. Doesn't mean you can't go lower. Uh, but what happens is that that's where you're probably at the trade-off between the depth of the well and how much data you're going to be getting out of that image through the ADU. Mm -hmm. Got it. And um, yeah, that, that's the best I can explain it right now. And I, I need to understand it in more depth, but that's the best I've, I've been able I've, to come I, up I've with. I've seen those graphs and I've kind of gone, so what? <laughs> what do I do yeah. with this information? <laughs> I was kind of in that ballpark at some point too. Now, these other two are actually ones that I find really interesting. The, uh, this one here is the dynamic range, the third one down. And notice for this particular sensor, it starts down at around just under 14, and then it drops down. But then at a gain setting of 100, it jumps back up, and then it starts dropping down again as the, uh, the gain on the, the camera is raised. And so the more dynamic range you have, the better off you are. But on this particular camera, notice that if you, you have a, a gain setting of zero to get maximum well depth, then what's gonna happen on this fourth slide, you're actually gonna have quite a bit of noise because that's the highest noise you're actually going to get. And the, the, and this is the read noise that you get, the dark current noise. And, um, and so what happens as you, as you look at this sensor and you look at these points, at 100, the read noise on this particular sensor drops very low. And then it actually gets lower as the ISO goes up. 
which is kind of interesting. If you look at the, the 1600 sensor, it's similar, but notice it doesn't have any of those drop-offs and the jump back up or anything. This is a, a more common uh, view. Um, one of the Nikon ca cameras I've got, um, um, it's, a, it's one of their high-end Nikons. It's a little bit older, but it's a, it's a D5. And it has some of this effect in it for the sensor that it has. And these are, it's a Sony sensor in this camera. And then it's a Sony sensor that's in my Nikon also. And so it looks like they, Sony brought in some of the same kind of functionality to the play so that when you start raising the, uh, the ISO or gain value, you're not really adding more noise necessarily. Um, what you're doing is reducing the dynamic range. And so one of the ways of looking at these charts, um, if you look at the, the bullet I've got on the left of these, um, if you use a gain of zero, um, then you're gonna have full well depth. You're gonna have great dynamic range, the best the camera's gonna produce. And your noise is gonna be high but see that the noise is probably about 3.4, 3.45. Um, if you look at the noise here, um, it's gonna be about the same as it, as it drops down on this particular camera. But the dynamic range just kind of, just falls off at a very even clip there. And so, if you put the gain at 100, you're still going to get good dynamic range. And I've seen some folks argue that don't use 100, use 101 or 102, because you really don't know how they, they set up that particular camera and that particular sensor. <coughs> um, and so you want to make sure that you're on the, the right side of this jump. And, um, but your reason noise goes down extremely low. And it, it gets so low so quickly that you're down into to this area about where the, um, the unit gain is for the 1600 camera. And so one of the, the, the guys I was reading on Cloudy Nights, he said he saw um, two gain settings he would recommend with this particular sensor. One is for the, um, if you're dealing with monochrome, he would recommend that if you're dealing with um, the, the broadband, the red, green, blue uh, filters, that you would set it to the gain value to zero to take advantage of the, 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 the full well depth and the high dynamic range. And then if you're using the um, narrow band filters, then he would set it to 100. And what he saw in his particular version of the camera was that 100 worked fine for him. He didn't have to fudge it by going above 100. And then you, you got a better sensitivity from the camera because of the higher gain. And, but you ended up with a lot less noise. And then you also ended up having decent um, um, dynamic range from the camera still. And so when, when you start looking at your camera and start looking at these graphs, you may be surprised because I'd always thought on my particular camera that I would stay with 100. I had never really considered going down to zero. But when I started researching gain value in the second diagram, I ran across a lot of guys arguing one way or the other before it. And, and they were saying that yeah, zero is perfectly good here and that this sensor just works well. So have I lost everyone there? Or? Fairly detailed there, Larry. A lot of detail there, I know. But I, I thought it was important because when you start looking at the, the cameras, this is something that um, comes into play and is important to understand about your particular camera. Or if you're looking for a new one, this would help you decide which one may or may not work better for you. So. Let me go to something that's still detailed, but hopefully not as esoteric as that. Uh, one shot color cameras. 
Um, I went with the monochrome and um, I, I used my DSLR as my one-shot color camera. And sometime in the future, I may very well buy a one-shot color astral camera. Um, and so I'm not trying to say that these are bad. They've, they've definitely got their place, but I, I want folks to understand how what that means when you get a one-shot color camera. And so you're gonna have a sensor that's called a Bayer sensor. And in that sensor, you're gonna have twice as many green pixels as you have blue and red pixels. And so if you look at the, the graph um, that's about the center, you'll see that lights coming in at the top, you get this blue filter, and that's representing a particular pixel site. Same thing with the red and the green. And so what happens when you look at the way it's exposed, the ones that are marked blue underneath, they're the ones that have the blue filter. They're the ones that are going to receive any of the blue light that's coming in. Same thing with the red light, same thing with the green light. And if you look at the far right side, you see that the full pattern of the, uh, the, the red, green, blue pixels that are spread across the, uh, the sensor. And um, this is just the way these, these sensors work and they, they work well for especially uh, uh, photography on the earth. And that's why there's so many green is that green tends to be a prominent color for um, landscape photography here. So when you convert this final image, um, you basically have to go through a, what's called a demosaicing algorithm. And what it does is you need to create from this pattern um, a green image, a red image, and a blue image. And so what happens is that the demosaicing algorithm interpolates, say you're making the blue image first, it interpolates all the other colors that are in between the blue into what it thinks should be there. But it, in reality, it's interpolating. It, it's making a best guess at what that image looks like. And it does the same thing for the red, it does the same thing for the green. And so that gives you your red, green, blue channels in the color image. And you can see those if you go into Photoshop and, and you look at the, the different channels that you can play with. But what's happening, recognize that that image doesn't have data behind a lot of the pixels that you're seeing. That, that's the gist of why a monochrome camera has more detail for the same sensor pixel size um, than a one-shot color camera. It's because the, the color filters that let you get away with a single image to create the color image isn't, isn't working with all the pixels evenly across all the colors at one time. Um, the, the results can be extremely good. Um, it's just not the, the, as sharp as a mono sensor. There are any questions before I go to the next one? Okay, there the are two other schemes here. There's a sensor that's called a Fogon, and um, this actually behaves more like people kind of think that color cameras probably should work like. What it, what it has is across the whole sensor, each pixel site has got a filter that and, and sensitivity in it for red, green, and blue. And so as the, the light travels through the, um, the, the stacked set of sensors for each pixel site, you actually capture what's blue and then what's green and what's red or, or really what's not not the colors above it. And so you actually get more detail out of these, but it doesn't seem like they really caught on with astrophotography. Um, Sigma cameras are currently using these with some of their cameras. And so they're out there. People are using them, but um, it, it, 
Some folks early on tried to use them for astrophotography, but they have a lot of noise. And because you're dealing with the stack sensors, the light sensitivity is low on these. And so they never really, really caught on for it. And there's another variant that's used by uh, Fujifilm cameras that's called X-Trans. And um, one of the drawbacks that Fuji sees with uh, the bear sensor is if you look at a particular row or column, um, that row has only got two or column only has two colors in it. So if you look at that lower right uh, diagram of the bear sensor and you look at the first column, you've got a, a green, red, and it repeats, and then you've got a, a blue, green, and so forth. And so if you look at each one of these, you really only have two colors in it. And what X-Trans did was they came up with a, a different pattern than a bear sensor um, so that each one of these rows does have all three colors in it or columns. And um, a lot of folks like the way the, the Fuji sensors look, uh, especially with uh, an image that's been converted to black and white. I've heard people that just love the way it looks. Um, but um, there are some, some of these cameras that you can use them for astrophotography, but I haven't seen anyone that's posted images that said they were actually using a, a Fuji camera for it. But I haven't really went out looking for it either. I just recognize that these are out there. Um, some of our guys in the club have actually been doing this. And, what happens is that one shot color cameras, um, you can get narrow band um, filters for them. And it's really a, a stack filter. Um, I mean, I've seen versions that come in uh, like in two, three, or even four stack filters. Does that match what you see? Um, I've seen three, um, three bends going through, but uh... Okay. Um, yeah, mostly oxygen, H beta, and H alpha. Um, but I, I'm sure there are a variety of filters out there. You know, uh, some of these bends are pretty wide to accommodate yeah. light from other other sources. And, but, sounds good. So what these filters are doing is um, the three main ones that you normally deal with are the hydrogen alpha the sulfur two and the oxygen three. Um, but what they do is they pass those narrow bands. And it, so you, you can actually get these that clip into DSLRs and mirrorless cameras. And, um, it, and they actually allow you to cut through the light pollution because in between this green and red, um, this notch here is where a lot of our, um, um, Light. sodium and mercury vapor lights um, fall. And um, so they're not even getting past. And then also the other advantage, these are so narrow that if the moon's out, unless you're really close to the moon, you're probably not gonna have an issue with the moon being too bright. And you'll still be able to image with those. Questions? Okay. So, um, Mono cameras uh, in black and white, um, basically what you do is you, you use a, a red, green, and blue filter, take separate images through each, and then you combine that into a color image. And you may also end up bringing into play a luminance filter, or you could bring in narrowband filters like we talked about on the last slide. But these were all shot separately. One one set of images for each one of the filters that you want to do. And they do bring out detail in the nebula, especially. Um, so I think we probably um, have kind of covered most of the rest of that. Uh, one of the things that come into play with uh, the astro cameras, especially, is the concept of bending. And what that allows you to do is to, uh, to take adjacent pixels and combine them to increase sensitivity and reduce the image size. And you can do it either in software or hardware. And the camera I've got actually does 
both software and hardware bidding. And it's a little bit different what you can do. And by software, I believe it's actually inside the driver for the camera that you install. And then one of the things that the camera I've got actually does too, is it drops from a 16-bit um, um, analog digital unit down to a 12-bit when you start doing binning because you're not going to be pushing as much data through it. Is the binning a meaningful concept for color cameras, hardware binning? I, I don't know how it would work in hardware. I believe it's done in software with the color, I mean. Right. And, and the reason I, I believe that is because I think what happens because of the way the bear sensor works, one of the things I, I'd come across a while back was looking at that. And um, with a bear sensor, the, um, the, the pixels around your pixels, say you, you have a blue, let me slide backwards a little bit here. Um, say you've got a, a blue uh, pixel, this one here. If you look at, um, if you make this a two by two, you can't just do a two right. by that's, two like that's this. That's exactly why I asked the question, yeah. Yeah, and so I'm not quite sure that the answer that I came across, and, and it was vague enough for, um, I'm still fuzzy on it because it, it, it was more, it was kind of hidden inside of what the camera manufacturer did with their drivers. But what the individual thought was happening was that they demosaic the image. So you've got all blue images and then you can just grab a two by two around it. Yeah. But the problem is, is I don't know how much of what you're looking at is interpolated versus, um, but there's real data there for the binning. And so it kind of gets off into kind of soft, yeah. confusing stuff. Um, okay. So this is another one that um, it, it's going to look confusing at first, but then I'm, I'm going to switch over to a, uh, a web page that will make more sense. And one of the things that, that you need to think about when you look at your camera and, and telescope and, and actually the seeing conditions come into play with this. Um, say you've got a thousand millimeter telescope and um, the sensor that you're dealing with is a four, um, help me, I mean, you am micro, Micrometers, Mil it's not millimeters. I'm drawing a blank on what UM is, sorry. Yeah, micro it's microns. Mi microns, thank you, thank you, Bob. So, um, so you end up with this value 0.82. And if you come down to here on the pixel size, 0.82 drops you in about here. Now, if you've got really great seeing, um, then, oops, pixel size, uh, okay, so this is the, you, you're actually could use um, tighter, smaller pixel size in the camera to get better resolution. Um, and then, if you drop down to this, you're actually good on excellent scene. And you, for typical scene, you're still okay. But then if you got fair scene, you actually are probably oversampling. And then you drop down to poor scene, it's even worse. There's a, um, let me figure out how to do this here. So I'm gonna stop sharing, I think for a second, um, Bob. Oh. You need to stop sharing this and then start sharing the web the, browser. The web browser, yeah. Okay. And You're not seeing anything yet, right? 
Uh, no. Okay. Juggling too many screens here. Okay, here we go. So this is off the astronomy tools and there's a bunch of tools on this site. But um, what this does is it replaces those tables that I found confusing. Um, and I think most people do. The telescope I've got is a 1200 millimeter, um, no Barlow on it. The camera I've got um, is the ZWO uh, ASI 2600. So that sets the pixel size. Um, let me set dinning to one to one. And let me say that the scene is okay. Um, it's probably what we have where we go to our star party site. And so basically the resolution is 0.65 um, seconds per pixel. And so what ends up happening is this white bar at the bottom there shows them just above the green. And this is yellowish in there for the, the info because I'm actually slightly oversampling with my setup and my telescope. But if I drop down to poor scene, which is what I normally have at home or very poor scene, um, then what happens is um, I'm actually worse than I was before. But one of the things I can do is come in to the binning switch it into a two by two. And now I'm back to about where I was before. Or if I go to a three by three binning, then I'm actually going to be matching my telescope and the camera and the binning. I get advantage of extra sensitivity by using nine pixels at one time. And, um, and I still end up with about as much resolution as I can handle with that condition. Um, there was some time back on the forum that um, Bruce posted something about binning and I, it took me a while to figure out what he was he talking about. And this is the gist of it here, is that depending on your scene conditions and how you set your binning, you can actually tailor it for your focal length of your telescope and your camera and how much how large the pixels are and what you can see and so just go to astronomy tools calculators and um, go down to ccd suitability it works for cmos too and um, there's a bunch of other cool tools there there's one other thing i'm going to show you so i don't waste time flipping back and forth here in a minute or two i'm going to talk about um, shutters and one of the types of shutters that I'm going to talk about is a rolling shutter. And a rolling shutter um, is kind of a special case. This is a simulation of a rolling shutter. So if you look at that line that's walking down the screen, that's the shutter. And effectively, what's happening is reading out a line of the sensor, which is what the sensor seeing is on the left part of the screen. And then the image that it's taking is on the right side so that when you finally get the complete image read out, um, what you see in that distorted fashion is the actual um, image you're gonna be left with. And so if you're dealing with something that's moving fairly quickly, rolling shutters can be a major pain. Um, they show up a lot of times in, um, um, video cameras, but a lot, of, um, a lot of the cameras that we deal with for um, deep space actually use rolling shutters. So they may use also another type called global, or they may actually use a mechanical shutter that just closes it off. But just kind of remember this, and I'll go back over, stop sharing, and I'll go back over to the presentation. So do most cameras have rolling shutters? Is that what I heard you say? Uh, 
Um, I think probably most of the ones that we're dealing with, unless you get to the higher end ones, have got rolling shutters. Um, some of the, the better ones have a rolling and a global. And um, so that's what I talked about there. Um, for time, I'm going to skip field flatteners unless someone has a question on them. No questions? Kate? Okay. Um, I'm going to skip the connectivity unless someone has got a question on it. Um, this was an area that drove me crazy for a while when I, uh, I got my cameras. Um, TWO has got a great web page that shows all sorts of options depending on which camera you've got and which pieces you want to bring into play, like an off axis guider and stuff. And um, normally it's not a big deal unless you've got a field flattener. And in which case, the field flattener needs to be precisely positioned in front of the, the, um, the sensor, in which case you really start caring about these millimeters that are coming into play. Another one there, and um, I'm going to skip the image size because this basically is just the options that you're going to find with the camera. And you may actually find out that your camera has a lot of capability that um, you don't normally use very often. And yeah, it's nice having the full resolution, but at the same time, you end up with these huge files. And if you really don't need them, then take, take advantage of the options of the camera to call it down some. Um, dithering. This is another thing I'd like to touch on briefly. Um, the camera sensors, because of the way the pixels are arranged in rows and columns, you usually end up seeing uh, fixed pattern noise, depending on what the image is that you're looking at. And what dithering, while it's not the, in the camera, the dithering is where the telescope actually slightly moves a few pixels between frames or between several frames. And what that ends up doing is it smooths out that fixed pattern noise. Um, Chuck had an image that he started doing some dithering recently. And uh, he had an image that was just gorgeous where he dithered and it got rid of so much of the noise that he was seeing in some of his other images. And it was all because of the fixed pattern noise that was coming into play. And uh, dithering can also help you with the hot pixels so that as the, the, the hot pixel will move to a, um, a different part of the, um, the, the sky. And so the, pro the processing during the stacking will tend to cancel those out. Um, I'm going to skip this one because this was just something I found interesting in my camera that there was a, a difference between the mono and the one shot color. In the mean, um, since you've got the one shot color version of this, you and I can talk about this sometime later. I just found it interesting. Okay. Um, two slides there for that. So this is the, the shutter and um, so global, which is the kind of the way you would think that the sensors uh, would work is they would you push the, the shutter, um, the sensor would stop collecting light, and then it would read all of the, um, the, the rows or columns, depending on which way the sensor reads out. It reads those all off, and then it starts collecting light again, it resets itself, starts collecting light again, and then when the shutter goes off, then it uh, repeats so on. Um, the, the problem with that is that the readout is a finite period of time. And since you're dealing with individual rows at a time on reading them out and the, the CMOS sensors, what's happening is if you use a rolling shutter, you could read out a, a specific row or column. You stop that row or column depending on the camera design, from collecting light, you read it out, and then you move to the next one where you stop it from collecting light. But while you're doing this, all the other um, rows or columns are collecting light. And so you're actually taking imaging data as 
um, the, the, the sensor is reading out on a row or column basis. And so it effectively gives you more exposure and more sensitivity from it. And oops, moved ahead. The, the other type of um, shutter that can come into play is the mechanical where you actually, like a, a focal plane shutter or a leaf shutter that you would find in conventional cameras. And um, so if you're dealing with these sky objects, the, the rolling shutters are not a problem. But if you're dealing with some planets where the, um, there, there's, there's a lot of rotation and you're doing a lot of imaging, then you potentially are gonna have some issues there. And I've not played with the planet, so I've not seen it. Um, if you do some searching on the web, you'll find some examples where they talk about rolling shutters and um, the way uh, helicopter blades or aircraft propellers start looking really strange um, in video cameras because of the way that rolling shutter works. Um, but if you're dealing with deep sky objects, you're probably okay. And uh, some of the higher end cameras have got either global rolling and maybe even also a mechanical shutter. Um, I'm going to, does anyone want me to go into long exposure noise reduction? This is a DSLR because I'm running a bit long here and I don't want to go into stuff that people don't want to get into. Um, file types, basically the gist of this is don't shoot JPEG. Um, it's a lossy format. It doesn't really retain all the sensor detail. and um, if you're going to shoot a DSLR mirrorless, shoot raw. If you're shooting astro cameras, you're probably going to be fits, or it could be a TIFF file image, depending on your camera. If you're doing video, then it's going to be one of the video formats. But um, but don't try to, to save space and, and go with JPEG. It's probably not going to be worth it in the long term. So I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, the frame types. Um, light frames are, are images that we take of the deep sky object, and they get corrected using calibration frames. One of the types of calibration frames is a, a flat frame. And um, you take this evenly illuminated field, um, and the optical system needs to be in exactly the configuration you use for light frames. So it needs to be at the same focus. It needs to not have anything changed around to remove. And what they're good for is vignetting, uh, removing dust, uh, and also evening out the sensitivity across photo sites. Uh, you can do it by putting a t-shirt over a lens and shooting a, a twilight sky, a even indoor wall, LED panel, so forth and you want to expose to the middle of the histogram. Um, if you're doing a, a DSLR typo there, then you should use a get away with aperture priority is probably gonna work. Um, I'm using Nina and it's got a flat wizard that simplifies this so that it's a piece of cake, right? These flats and an adjacent type of thing called a dark flat. And the, um, the flat darks or dark flats, um, they're basically a dark file, your darks that you created for your lights, except these are the ones that are created for the flat files. And um, if you've got a cool camera, you probably really don't need them unless you're doing long exposures. Um, I've been shooting them and I can tell you if it's really helping or not yet, but I'll keep doing it for now. Bias and offset frames, these are by far the easiest ones to make. Um, they're similar to dark frames, but you shoot at the camera's shortest exposure with the lens cap on. And so what's happening is shortest exposure, you're not getting any heat built up in the sensor and you're not getting any light. And so what you're seeing is just whatever the noise is that comes from the sensor as it reads the, the, the rows and columns and transfers them out into a, a, a frame that's going to be used. 
And you do want to make sure you're using the same gain as in your light frames so that they're compatible. Uh, dark frames are the normal ones you take by uh, closing off the end of the telescope with a um, cap or whatever. And these are looking for the temp thermal signature that you get with hot and cold pixels um, because of your longer exposures and heat. Uh, you want the same gain, exposure duration, and temperatures for your light frames. Um, one thing that can keep take advantage of is you, the thermal signature in most cameras are linearly proportional to exposure duration and temperature. So you can create a set of dark frames with a long exposure and some processing software can actually take advantage of those and scale them down to whatever your images were actually shot at. So it's a way to not have so many of these laying around. And um, number of frames, basically if, if you look around, you'll find people recommending numbers all over the place. What I'm doing right now, and I'm not an expert, is I'm shooting 40 flats, 40 flat darks, 30 bias or offsets, and 25 darks. And when I say I'm shooting this many, I've got a monochrome camera, and it's got seven different filters, including uh, luminance, red, green, blue, and then three narrow bands. So I'm actually shooting this many times seven. So it ends up being a lot of images. But one of the things that happens when you process with DSS, and I suspect with other processing software, these calibration files get converted into master files. At that point, you can use the master files and avoid potentially saving these unless there's a reason you want to go back and recreate the masters um, and also get safe storage and then also save processing time. Um, this table is kind of a summary of, um, of creating the, uh, the different calibration files. And the last slide is um, kind of a summary of uh, Peter Adams, who's a longtime photographer. And uh, his view on cameras is that they're a tool. Uh, just like a typewriter never created a novel, camera is not going to create a great astro image. It needs to be something that, that you put your time and sweat and, and, and effort into to create an image that you're proud of and that you're happy with. And I can guarantee you from what I've seen so far with my work, um, it's not an easy road with the astrophotography. I'm enjoying it. I love it. But at the same time, it's not simple. It's probably the hardest type of photography I've ever tried to do. So that's... Um, that's it. Any questions, anyone? Sorry, we ended up talking longer than I was hoping to. Well, thank you, Larry. I, that was that was very comprehensive, and uh, and uh, pretty easy to follow. So, I'll I'll uh, ask everybody else on the in the audience if they have any questions. Uh, Uh, anybody? I didn't have any. No. Okay. Thanks, guys. Sorry I yeah. went so long. So, and... No, no so, problem. No, no problem. And I, I will put this out on the on the on the YouTube channel as well, and we'll have it there. So, just as a last thing, you know, I've got uh, we've got uh, next month uh, uh, Miller Bernard, Bernard Miller coming back again, and.